because what I say is that the immigrant is a bit an outsider, comes with a different cultural baggage, can see the gaps that the one who's been living there forever does not necessarily see, plus can bring new components to fill those gaps. This particular time, when cities are actually uh, developing a kind of blank inside their whole uh, governing framework, because they're all in crisis. Most cities have a budget deficit. I mean, it's really serious stuff. They have to cut, cut, cut. They have been, the uh, resources have been taken away from them by the national governments or whatever. Um, they have, they deal with most of the serious problems of the country, bring in the new types of conflicts, the conflicts around religion, Conflicts around immigration, conflicts around unemployment, the conflicts around toxicity, you know, the environmental issue. And you have, everybody is mobilized in the sense of, wow, nothing is quite exactly the way it was. So people are on alert, governments are on alert, what is going on, etc., etc. In that context, the immigrant outsider can see things that the local doesn't see. I, ideally, I repeat, ideally, this is a very interesting marriage of convenience. They are used to something different, a more paternal structure maybe, back home. So they see a lack. And in that, so anyhow, in these small cities around New York now, you are exactly seeing that. For a mayor of a small city, for instance, uh, the, the, the issue of violence now includes racism, racist acts against immigrants. So the, the local mayor can choose, the local government can choose to, to say, okay, more police deployed there. Or to start negotiating with the immigrant community to sort of bring in feedback. So the immigrant relationship to the police is a fairly well-established one that often means that the, the city mayor, that also is New York City, that is Boston, it's one of the big cities as well, has some immigrants that are delegates from the immigrant community, from different immigrant communities who, in that process, city government then understands something also about how to deal with natives who are low income. It starts as an immigrant police issue, it escalates to local government to the immigrant, and then out of that they can triangulate. Mm -hmm. and deal with something that does not involve the immigrant, but involves the larger governance question. In them. And that can be multiplied. When it works out like this, it's the result of negotiation. It's the immigrants telling local government, you know, we are the only source of life on this block, which is next to the subway station. We reduce criminality if we're there. You know, we are little shops, like five little shops, three little shops, it makes a lot of difference. We, we begin to constitute a sub economy so that people can actually buy stuff there rather than always having to go spend their money elsewhere or having to travel. And in that sense, little incomes begin to recirculate income. So it all builds up and that's good for the city. Well, I mean, it's not a new history, you understand? We tend to think that today is somehow very different. Every epoch has its particularity. But we have been there before. Been there before with having migrants, with having international networks, you know, where, where the immigrant, the refugee, the exiled, whatever, can play a significant role. And so this is really not known. Think of any of our cities. In each epoch, there have been people of both sides of the divide, you know, the long-term natives, who also may have been at the origin immigrants, and the outsider of, of that moment, um, who decided that, um, that they had to work together, that inclusion, maybe not absolute, but had to happen. So that to me is very interesting. I think that the claims by the outsider for inclusion become a benefit if they succeed. Those claims are met, they also have the effect of expanding the rights of the inside. I think that one of the ways in which the citizen, as a subject carrying rights, has expanded her rights 
is because of the claims of the outside. Because it is a more rational, it's a more repressive atmosphere, also in the US. It's an active persecution of immigrants. So something, I always say the United States, these are the Latin American immigrants coming from southern border. It's gone from a space of opportunity to a space of active persecution. So something has really changed, you know. I, I sense something like that in, in Europe as well. Things have, you know. It's not the first time that this happens, but there are these ups and downs. So I think that ultimately uh, we have to move beyond the differences of religious doctrine, cultural differences. You know, if they want to wear burqas, let them wear burqas. We have more women now using vests because of the whole. So a city that allows this diversity of practices and you know, huge cross, big veils, let it be. Eventually it will find its own hybrid shape. You know, I think, but when you begin to repress, when you begin to say this is right and this is not right, as a city you are in trouble. The city has always been a space that is slightly anarchic, otherwise it's not a city. Then it's a controlled urban space, you know. But, so let there be a bit of anarchy, let there be disorder, out of that a new kind of order emerges. It's like chaos theory, really. The city has that capacity, you know, to have feedback loops. No central planner can control the city. Impossible. Let's accept that. States have gone, right, some type of states, uh, look at the whole Soviet Union, etc., all the Central, Ameri the Central European firms have gone. Cities, they have survived far longer times than most nation states and than most firms. It tells you something about a systemic property. Now, it's really interesting when you think about it, you know? <laughs>